And I'm gonna do this with my eyes closed and one-handed, one, one hand behind my back, so to speak. So you to enter 50 times, look up, hey, we're done. So see, bash is really simple. You too can do it with your eyes closed, one-handed. <laughs> Programming, gaming, fitness, Jesse Warden. What up, ladies and gentlemen? Jesse Warden here, once again, to talk to you this time about Gulp something you don't do to a Malbec. Gulp is a build system very similar to Grunt, and the reason we're talking about it is we're moving to the future. Every single video, thenceforth, henceforth, going forward, moving forward, will be about ECMAScript 6. That is the new version of JavaScript, also referred to as ECMAScript 2015, which is a bad name. So we're gonna call it ES6 for short, because that's when everyone else who knows what they're doing actually calls it. However, in order to do so, we need to be able to code in a browser. Well, the only browser that kind of has it is IE public release. I'm not on a PC and Chrome Canary has flags for it, but they don't work quite yet. Only real way to code the JavaScript of tomorrow to use it today to support the browsers of yesterday is using a transpiler such as Babel, which used to be called six to five. There's also another one called Tracer. What it does, it takes the JavaScript we write that's new and fresh and converts it to older JavaScript that runs like we've been coding. They're very similar in syntax, but the world's moving to ES6, so I'm gonna start teaching it for all the concept we've been doing, and we'll still code in old JavaScript. They look very similar. But in order to make that happen, we have to have a firm foundation IDE to support that, right? Or a build system. Currently, there's no real IDE that makes it simple. It has this built in. WebStorm's getting close, IntelliJ, but it's not quite there yet. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use Gulp with Babel to make this happen in a variety of plugins. So I'm gonna get you started on Gulp. This will give you the basics. I highly encourage you to watch my NPM, Bauer, Node, and Grunt video. It's very similar. Grunt and Gulp are very similar. If you get those basics up, you'd figure out how to get sudo working in your bash or whatever shell you want for Windows. You'll have the tooling ready for me to help you out. If you don't know what Gulp is, it's very similar to, to Grunt. Go to Google, type in Gulp, and you'll see Gulp.js, the build streaming system. And if you look at the docs, they have basically a GitHub that points you to their recipes and documentation, right? So bottom line is it's a streaming API, very similar to Gulp. Gulp is a big chunk of JSON with a few functions, right, here and there. Whereas Gulp is a bunch of streams and code. So they both are cool. Grunt's a lot newer, a lot little more little configuration, but the plugins aren't as vast. It's not as battle tested, and a lot of the developers are not always aware of how to streamify their API. They wrote a plugin for Grunt and they're porting it to Gulp. There might be some weird ways in which you have to do it. And plus, error handling is also not as obvious, right? Because it's code that's run, which you may think would make it easier, but sometimes not, especially in the streaming context. I'm assuming you have Node installed. I am an artist. I grew up you know, with an art degree. I, I'm not an artist now, but I, I know this much about bash, okay? So the command line, things like that. I don't like it, I don't like to use it. I like to use buttons and UIs. So I'm gonna teach you enough to, to be dangerous, just like I am, okay? You know as little as I am, you can be productive, right? You can run enterprise applications, you can build apps, you can build games, you can automate your workflow, right? Make things a lot more fun, a lot more automated, and do some pretty advanced things with just a little bit of bash commands. So if you open Terminal on Mac, or whatever PowerShell, or Seguin, or whatever command line you like to use on Windows, uh, the commands are not exactly the same, so your mileage is going to vary on some of the OS specific things. But the gulp commands that I show will not. They'll be the same. Okay, same with the NPM and the bower. For Mac, first things first, I like to do clear, then the and and symbol, then clear, then the and and symbol and clear to blank out everything so I don't have to see all these weird terminal things, okay? So the first thing you need to do is CD to the directory of where you want to go or change directory, okay? If you don't know where you are, Right, you say PWD, which looks like password, but it's shows show me the directory I'm at. So it's basically the folder path where you're at. It's the same thing as looking at uh, Finder on Mac or Explorer on Windows. It shows you know the folder. So if I want to go into the folder, right, I want to go up, I say CD dash dash with a space. Here I can just hit back, right, and click. So Okay, command line's powerful, that sounds great, you can automate it. If I want to CD to the folder, I have to know what the folder name is. Well, if you don't know, there's a couple ways to find out. You hit ls, say what are the folders and files, like list them, ls list, list the folders and files in the folder I'm at. Right, so it'll show them sometimes with a tab, sometimes with this weird space, but it's there. If you don't know, you can say cd uh, tab, hit it again, and it'll give you a list to choose from. 
if you want to type but you're too lazy to finish it, you can just hit tab as you type and it'll often fill it out for you, right? So in that case, noob, there's only one, hit tab and enter and now I'm in the folder. You now learn two commands, well, three commands if you count clear. So ls, there's nothing in gulp new, just like there's nothing here. This .ds store, it doesn't show dot .files in command line unless you use special commands. And we don't really care about dot .files, okay? Or hidden files on Windows, whatever you wanna call them. First thing we're gonna do is I'm assuming you have Node installed globally, right? You globally have NPM. And again, globally means just like if I launch Photoshop or Chrome or Minecraft or Steam or Notepad or TextEdit or any other globally accepted application, if I open it, right, it's installed in the entire machine. Node and Bower and NPM and all that stuff allow you to install applications per folder, right? Specific versions and plugins per folder. So if a project depends on a particular version or you want to guarantee that that version doesn't get messed with as things, you know, sometimes people add features and accidentally break old things. We can guarantee that that's stays safe. So we're gonna install everything that you need in that particular folder. And that way we can guarantee that it'll work if you check it in, you come back weeks later, months later, you wanna verify you have something strong and solid to refer to, it's there for you. Is create a manifest file, also known as a package JSON. Package.json is a file that describes your project. It tells you all the, the tools that you need and all the libraries you need. Tools are things like Grunt, uh, things that take your JavaScript files and check them for syntax errors optimize them, shrink them down, right? So if you put them on a the web, they're really fast to download, combine all the files together, take all your images and compress them, all kinds of plugins like that. Those are your tool. Your libraries are things like Angular or EaselJS or Moment or, or Lodash or Underscore or Backbone or any of those libraries that you actually put in your web page. Bower typically takes care of them. But again, the whole concept of dependencies and development dependencies. Development dependencies are your tools. Dependencies are what actually deployed your web page. So we're gonna install our first one. We gotta create a manifest. The easiest way is npm init. And I'm gonna do this with my eyes closed and one-handed, one, one hand behind my back, so to speak. So you just hit enter 50 times. Look up, hey, we're done. So see, bash is really simple. You too can do it with your eyes closed, one-handed. Bower init is the same way. So we're gonna use Bower later on for libraries. Let's get it set up now and do it. Oh, let's, let's make it even challenging. Hit enter with my, my left hand. Okay. See, I have an art degree. I can use Bash. So can you. Fantastic. All right. So we have a Bower JSON and a package JSON doing LS. If you want to take a look at those files, it basically names our project, right? And this is for two reasons. Package JSON will allow us to identify what our project is. If we would like to publish it for the world to consume and play with, we can do that. This file is where all that data is stored, what the name of it is, where is the GitHub repo it's stored in, who wrote it, what license is it under, what libraries does it need to run, and what libraries does it need to, to test and develop locally, right? Those are gonna be listed here as well. And basic scripts and tests and everything else. There's a lot of people who build websites today who just utilize package JSON. They don't even use Bower, and that's okay. We're gonna use everything because we are gonna power up. We're gonna do it enterprise style with these tons of complexity. So now that we have our main two files, right? These are the only files that you check in, right? You don't actually check in the known modules folder or the Bower components to your source control. In fact, you can delete them if you need the file space on your hard drive and you can npm install later when you let it play with your code. So that's kind of kind of the cool thing for it. We're gonna npm install, which is command, grunt, gulp, <laughs> growl, I, wanna, I want them both. I want declarative JSON with streams. It's impossible, Jason. So we're gonna say save or save dev. Save dev is I have a Minecraft hammer, right? You're not gonna actually take the hammer and put it in the house when you're building the house, right? The Minecraft hammer is your, your gulp, your grunt, your tools to build. The actual house, the wood and everything else, that's the deployment stuff, that's dependency. So if you say save dev, and it goes to the interwebs and says, I need this thing, let me install it for you. It's gonna put everything and every library you need in the node modules, right? So gulp, I installed gulp, it's gonna put it in node modules, right, for NPM. Node modules will have, Gulp will have his node modules in his folder, right? And on down the line. So everybody has their dependencies, okay? So cool. If we want to delete this, right, when we're done, or we just want to copy and give it to a friend, we only need to give them these two files. As long as they have Node as well, that will allow them to install all the libraries they need as well. Good thing is Node and NPM will actually cache so we can do it twice. So we got Gulp, we're good to go there. If we actually check and click on our package JSON, whoosh, you'll notice that it has dev dependencies. This is Gulp. 
So these development dependencies will, you know, are what I need to run. I need to use Gulp to build my application and write my ES6 code, but I don't need you to actually deploy it to my website. So there's a lot of plugins that will look at this package JSON, look at the dependencies, grab those libraries and throw them in your web server for you. It will ignore the dev dependencies. So we have Gulp. How do we know if Gulp works? Well, very similar to Grunt, so we have to have a file called a Gulp file. Notice the lowercase g, not uppercase, like Grunt file. Case sensitivity, crazy. Now, since we're writing node code, we have all kinds of magic things that the browser does not have. And that is the magic require word. That's right, it's very similar to require.js. If you don't know what require.js is, it is a module system. I know it's kind of advanced. We've talked about OOP, but not modules, which is slightly different from classes and packages and dependency injections. All those concepts wrapped into one amalgamation. If you go look at my require.js video, I have two of them. I have a, an intro and then the second one where I walk through you know four types of code and challenges that you'll face. That'll get you up and running on require. This is the synchronous version, which Require.js supports both. Node, it just so happens, you know, JavaScript that runs on your on your computer, runs on your client, not in the browser. Node actually has this built in, which is kind of cool. It's synchronous. So we're gonna use require. Now we have gulp. Cool. So how do we know if it did something? Well, gulp has a method called task. Now it's two parameters. Second parameter can be a function or a string, but we're not gonna worry about that or uh, array, but let's worry about the two that really make it simple to play with. First is the task. I'm going to say, hello. So that's the name of the task. You're going to create a bunch of tasks. You say, gulp, run that task. And then you're going to say, gulp, I want you to run all of those tasks, or I want you to run all of those tasks in this particular order. You're going to build a bunch of tasks and have 50 billion things going on, sometimes things going on at the same time, all to build an epic, awesome application. So the second parameter is the function. So when I say gulp, hello, it's going to run this function. Pretty simple, right? So far, so good. We're going to use a console log, just like we would in a browser, except instead of showing the browser, it's going to show in our terminal. So we're going to say, what's up? If you can't see that in your terminal, I don't know what's going down, bro. So we're going to say gulp, uh, hello, and hit enter. Hey, what do you know? What's up? It worked. So it shows you that it's starting the task, runs the task, and then lets you know when it finished the task. It took 68 nano milliseconds. I don't know what that stands for, but it's really fast. It's faster than a millisecond. So far, so good. We now have a task. Let's create a default task and show you the second format of the task. Default is when you do not include a task name after goal. In our case, we're going to pass an array, an array of tasks, a list of tasks to run. When you tell Gulp to run default, it'll run the following tasks. In this case, it's going to run, hello. So if we run Gulp without a task name, it'll run the default task, which in this case is hello. Pretty rad, right? Now, what happens if you misspell something or this code screws up? What happens? How do you debug this? So we're going to say gulp.tack. My words are attack. Let's run Gulp. You'll get exceptions, but they're not always colored. There are plugins for this, right? So it can look a little bit nicer like Chrome does. In our case, I'm using terminal with like default stuff. I'm not a bash man. Bash man. So we have type error. Gulp has no tack and it'll give you the line number. So very similar, you know, stack traces of, I was running the code and it exploded here. So you get the same kind of thing and you can debug. So you have a, a fighting chance. The problem is as libraries get bigger and bigger and bigger, this starts to become useless. <laughs> so good luck. Console log is your friend, unless you want to get Nodemon and other plugins that actually do breakpoints. We'll get to that in way future videos. So we can run our gulp, it's good to go. So as we build upon this, we're gonna leave this guy here. This is our, as Star Trek would call it, our level one diagnostics. This is our ability to, all right, so I have a function and it goes, yo, you can't get much simpler than that. So as we build complexity and something breaks, we want to make sure how broke is it, right? This allows us to figure out if our, you can't run gulp hello, something really bad happened. So we're going to leave that around for those kind of horrible scenarios. We're going to be we're already so ready. How ready are you? Well, we have a hello task. Oh, wow, you're really prepared. <laughs> Fantastic. I'm standing behind you in the hurricane of death. Any web page requires an end uh, web page. What is this, 1998? Any web app, web application, any application 
requires an index.html file. Sort of, kind of. You'll notice that I put it in root, that's bad. Now, as your projects grow in size, you're gonna need a way to organize them and as you're doing advanced things with JavaScript, not just ES6, but all kinds of optimizations and plugins and image manipulation, you need to have the source files, the raw elements in which you're building and the actual built files, the conversion, the optimized JavaScript, the optimized images, the optimized CSS, the minified code, the checked code, the good code, the deployed code. This is gonna be different than your source, ultimately. And as time goes on, they're gonna get very, very different. So you need to have two places. Now, what most people do is have a source folder. So they have a source folder, SRC. And if you want to see, you could do that in Bash as well. Or you could do a make dir, make directory. In this case, source, right? Same thing. So they have a build directory or a disk directory or a lib directory or a bin directory. They're all for different situations and there's conventions. Bottom line is I like build. We're making an app. We're going to build it. We're going to take our source mangle it together somehow magically and have a build folder. So that's what I'm going to create, okay? So our build folder there. So we're going to take our index, our raw index, source index, and yes, it's going to be different. You might think like, what did, What could you possibly do in an index file? Oh, yes, it will done. He'll do some magic, All right? Trust me, we're going to make this, we're going to make this baby shine. Okay, we're gonna make a basic HTML file. We're gonna have an H1 tag with Mr. Bottom Size Machine. Go. Okay. Very good. That's our basic index HTML file. And what we wanna do is we wanna do some kind of edits and at the end of the day, copy that index HTML file to the build folder. And that's where we're gonna open our browser and show our changes. We're actually gonna see what we built. ES5 JavaScript, ECMAScript 5 or 3, whatever. The JavaScript that works in just about all browsers, sometimes IE 8. That's what we're gonna do. But to do that, we have to copy. So let's learn some new gulp tests, shall we? We're gonna make a new one. We're gonna call it copy index. Now you can use any format you want. I'm sure there's a convention in Gulp. I don't really care. You can say copy index. You can use lowercase, right? I'm gonna use camel case because I'm a crackhead. Yeah. So we have our function, copy index. Now, Gulp is built on the concept of streams. Streams are magical constructs from the land of functional programming. Functional programming is a level up from OOP. So as our race evolves of human beings, right, homo sapiens, as we get smarter and we all are born with a default of 160 IQ, we will all be coding in functional programming as if it's normal, assuming the sh machines haven't risen up and destroyed us. For now, most of us are doing oops, so we cherry pick the neat things and smart people make them easier for use and still keep the magical names on them. So streams really are just arrays that emit events. That's really all they are, but everyone tries to complicate them. The problem too is that Gulp has plugins that don't always work with streams. So you'll see some of those warts here in a minute. The concept of a stream is to take a result and then pass it to the next function, right? It's kind of like a, a when we say the word array or list or a collection, right? Or stream, they mean the same thing for the most part. And it's kind of like a factory line. So if you think of Gulp or Grunt as your build system, they're gonna do a bunch of things to your JavaScript. They're gonna check it for errors. They're gonna make sure there's no style strangeness going on. They're gonna concatenate all those files into one. Because one file usually will download in most cases faster than 50 billion files. Then you're gonna minify it or shrink it down, right? So you have these four steps and they happen in order and they have to happen in that particular order first. You don't wanna syntax check stuff that you've minified. You wanna make sure it's good quality first, okay? So that's these are the steps in the stream. So you're gonna take the output of each and shove it to the next, like a conveyor belt of quality control. People you know, in a factory or a quality control line checking each piece, doing their job. And that's effectively what a gulp stream is. So I'm gonna write it in two ways for you so you can actually see the old school way. It's not gonna work, but it's, it, it, it gives you a mental model what's really going on. Because it took me six months to get streams. Now they're like second nature. But six months ago, they weren't second nature. So I can understand how it's very difficult and that's okay. So let's write it the right way first. We're gonna take a gulp source. Source means, hey, give me a list of files or f a file that you wanna do something with, right? And gulp is smart enough to look at the folders, verify they're there and do kinds of all kinds of magic wrappers around them. They call them vinyls. 
ICOM files. <laughs> right. If you're a plugin developer, it's important to know why they're vinyl because they're actually a pointer to a file. Nobody cares. So we're gonna say we're gonna copy our source folder slash index.html. We want that file, okay? And we're gonna pipe it. And what that means is we got our index.html, we're gonna give it to somebody else. Who are we gonna give it to? We're gonna give it to the gulp dest function. The gulp dest function says, all right, I got this index.html, what am I gonna do with it? Well, I would like you to put it in the build folder, okay? So we've done our first stream here with this, with this pipe function. So gulp source and everything returns a stream, right? But for the most part, this pipe function actually does something with the stream. It takes the stream and pipes it elsewhere, right? So if you imagine in your head, you have an array, you have a bunch of pipes that you keep adding on to them, right? And putting different things in there. So I have some data, I filter it, I make sure it's legit, and then I put it in a folder, right? That's what a pipe is, it's a stream, it's an array, you know, each item. Normal non-stream way to write that is the file or files gulp.src src slash index.html right so that's going to return an array or a list of files or vinyls whatever you want to call them right the things i i need so hey gulp go find these files right based on these file paths gulp will give those to us next is all right gulp whatever files you copied right i need you to take that those list of files that I got the files or files and please put them in this directory. Okay. If it's not there, make it. If it's already there, overwrite what's there. And whenever you're done, return what you actually did with those. Did you copy them? Are they good? What folder did you copy them to? Okay. So that's effectively what we've done so far. So I'm going to, I'm going to keep these lines there. I'm going to comment them out, but I'm keeping them there. So you're in your head. You can actually see what the stream is doing behind the scene. If we want to test this and see if it actually worked, what is it doing? We can say gulp copy index. And what it does is it copies index runs and oh, it actually took milliseconds this time. Ho oh, oh. ho, right? Not, I guess like 50 billion electron rotation orbits happened. So you'll notice I now have my build folder created and the index HTML file copied there, right? So same and same. So that's the file we actually create copied. Let's go open him right now. And we can see Mr. Body Massage Machine go is loaded just fine. We are going to make some changes called, hello, how are you? And we will refresh the page and notice nothing changed. We actually have to run our build system. In this case, copy index, right? So our default build system should be, instead of hello, it should be copy index for now, right? That's our main build. So if we run gulp, we want it to run our main build, our main dude, whatever it is, the default thing that we would expect to happen. So when I run that copy index, now it actually shows my new web page when I refresh. But what's the problem with refreshing? Well, if we're building this automated system, why should I have to refresh? We don't have to. There are two things that we can do to make that happen. The first is a plugin called Browserify, which will identify that something changed and allow you to say, hey, reload. Reload will tell the browser or browsers, right? If you're testing multiple browsers, all the ones that are open to refresh whatever files they were looking at. So automatically Apple R or Control R for you. Pretty rad. You notice that in every single video I've ever done, we've always been doing, you know, Control R, Apple R by default. Well, that's gonna go away. We're gonna automate that. So we need to do two things. We need to watch the file and we need to tell the file to reload. So let's do the reload first. To get the Browserify powers, you need to install it. So we're gonna npm install, browser sync, and we'll do a save dev because we don't want browser sync in our web page. We just want it in our local development environment to build the web page. Okay, it's gonna go to the internets. Look on the NPM package registry. Yo, you heard of this guy? He's over there. Cool. Let me go get him. I need to run this stuff. Copy him right there and shove it in node module. So let's get browser sync to work. Browser sync. Now that we've installed it, requires smart enough to look in node module. Our browser sync with the dash is there. Now you can write this in two ways in node if you're not. Used to write node code on the client or node plugins on the, on the client or server. You can do it like this, or you can kill the bar and kill the semicolon and put a comma. And you have a big old list. That's another way to do a big old list without having to write var 50 million times. I'm just going to write var 50 million times because I'm a crackhead. All right, that's what we're going to do. Now, Browser Sync is one of those plugins that's not really sure what to do with streams yet. So they've kind of added a, a simple way of 
saying you're in stream mode, <laughs> right? It's a little, a little disappointing. So the last thing we do from the files that we copied, we wanna refresh the index.html. So we're gonna say, hey, browser sync, call your reload method. Oh, and by the way, set the stream option to true. So it's aware that it's fixing to get its files that it's supposed to refresh on the browser from a stream rather than being a normal streaming support API. So this is just one of the warts of some of the plugins that work with Gulp. They're not like, what's this stream? Hey Gulp, I hear you're cooler than Grunt. What's up dog? And he's like, stream. And they're like, yeah, I'm a stream. My streams are cool, man. <laughs> right, that's unfortunately what they do, okay? So to add to our pseudocode, so you understand what's going on, we are saying, hey, browser sync, go ahead and reload the uh, files you copied, right? In this case, the index.html specifically, right? It's gonna look for the HTML, index.html. And if browser sync actually did stuff, the files you refreshed, or re I'm sorry, reloaded. Right, so that's what a stream does. This is what the progressive, you know, old school procedural way does. That's really what's going on in the background, okay? So this is all good and well, it reloads. But the, the trigger for that reload is what we just did. We need to have somebody watching it. So when that trigger goes off, they know to refresh it, right? So how do we do that? Well, we need to start a server, right? A local server. So browser sync can know, hey, files change, reload the server, reload the page. So to do that, we're gonna create a new task, in this case called browser sync, right? <laughs> Pretty standard stuff. But what it does, is it actually calls the browser sync function itself and it starts up a server. In this case, the server starting to look like Grunt, isn't it? <laughs> it's because these kind of things were built before Go. So the server has a base directory and in this case, build. So we're gonna run our server from build. So our application or web app or website, whatever you're building is running from the build directory, okay? That's where our server is going to start. So if you want to test it out and see if you can actually run a server, we can go gulp browser sync. Now it'll start a server and you'll notice that it, it looks very similar to my build, except instead of this file colon blah, 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 like it's a file path, it's actually running from localhost, right? Localhost is the same thing as my local computer or my computer that I'm working on. For now, it's going to run on 3000 and serve our site from Build. By default, it's looking for index.html, which we just so happen to have in build. So everything's working. We got our server, served our page. Well, we have to watch. Now that we have our server, we're good. And we've told, hey, our files have changed. We need to do a watch. So can you watch this file or files and uh, you know take some action when they change? The server know, hey, things are changed. We need to reload those particular ones. So we'll have a task called watch file. And our watch files task, we we'll use the gulp watch functions. Now you watch, you've learned yet another gulp dir, gulp dest, gulp task, and gulp watch. So gulp watch will watch a any expression of files. Expression means a string that can mean many different things. It could be the actual file path. In our case, it's you know source um, slash index. HTML. For now, just watch the uh, file. That file changes. You gotta let Gulp know. What do you want to do? Files change. I just uh, is there some somebody you want me to tell? Some task you want me to run? We're gonna recopy the index file. So every time you and I are messing with the source file, HTML, we hit save. It's gonna immediately copy it there. We're gonna call our copy index, and we're good to go. So as we're coding, we're gonna copy. It's gonna rerun the copy index. Copy index is, hey, server reload. If the server's running, which it is, then it'll rerun that task. Now, there's one problem with the sequence of tasks. As you'll notice, the web server is running, so I can't run tasks. I have two options, at least on Mac. I can stop the server and start it again, or I can open a new tab and start doing additional work in here. So I'm still in the same folder, but I, I don't have to interrupt the server, which is kind of running on this tab. I'm gonna run the gulp watch files. Now this task is forever running. It's not gonna stop. So you can see how this is finished, but it's actually still waiting to go. So you'll see my server is running. I'm gonna close the other tab so I don't get confused. And I will open up the index.html and instead of hello, I'm gonna see, change it to oy vey. Hit save. And you can see it ran our copy index. Pretty cool, right? All right, so let's stop our web server real quick. And let's put both of these tasks together. 
we want to launch our server and then while our server is running we also want to watch those files so they run in parallel we're going to change our default task copy the latest index there's obviously something there call browser sync start a web server and start running from there after we've copied our initial good stuff and then watch the files but while you're running the server, I want the last thing you do to watch the files in case they change. Run our new gulp, just gulp, right? It's gonna run everything. Go to our index.html and change it to, boy vey, man. And as you can see, it updates, right? So now we can spend the rest of our day editing our index.html, our JavaScript, our CSS, and it'll constantly change in the browser window without us having to do anything. Pretty rad. And the good news is once you check in this gulp file, you never have to touch it again. You can actually use this from project to project to project, slightly tweaking things, right? You might have more source files you wanna add, whatever else. Cool, so we've got some HTML, but what's going on with the JavaScript compilation? Now, to write the JavaScript of tomorrow and use it today on older browsers, what you have to do is utilize a transpiler. One of the easiest ones to get started with has all the cool new stuff for React and all the other stuff is Babel. It used to be called 6 to 5, and they've actually merged with ES Next. Now there's a lot to learn using this compiler, okay? But they have a try it out button to actually play. So if you wanna write the JavaScript tomorrow using like class person, and it has a method of, let's say, attack, console.log, of you. Now you can see that it's generating ES5 on the right that'll work with a class-based system and it'll only import the types of things that you need. So for example, we're not utilizing an inheritance, but if we had class gladiator that extends person, right? And then within the, uh, cont the attack method, in the attack method, if we were to call super.attack, and then do additional things. So we have inheritance, we have you know polymorphism, we have all that stuff, and it's off and to the right and good to go, right? So everything's in there, it's all generated, it's all works in older browsers, there's nothing in here. And they even go a step further in supporting the ES5 configuration of some of the runtime of particular objects. So for example, writable and configurable, when you're doing a lot more hardcore <laughs> oop of around control of the prototypes and using some of the new object methods. They're all there. Babel takes advantage of that. Now, the easiest way to do this, obviously, is to install a plugin. So what we'll do is we'll npm install go Babel and we'll save that dev. Oh yeah. He's happy. We'll go Babel. Acquire it. Actually, we'll just call this Babel since that's really just a reference to it. Uh, stop that anytime sublime make a new task so now we have what four tasks and one of them is a diagnostic so far so good task is babble it just a little bit i want to see ya babble it being good citizens we return our stream from our function before we even start writing it right or as we write it go source you know what gold source is yo go i need a bunch of source files with this magic string and for now we're just going to hard code it to source.app okay so that's our js file it's going to be es6 classified not that classified you know you know what I mean. and then we're going to let's tab just a little bit we'll pipe it and we'll call the magic babble right that's babble it's our wrapper for gulp around babble so it knows how to work with that so we're going to say all right babelfy Take the uh, app.js or any files. It could be a, a huge list of JavaScript files. Pipe them into Babel, all right? Shove them in there. And then when Babel's done with them, whatever comes out of Babel, I don't care what, please put it in the gulp dest. You remember gulp dest? Copy a file to a destination. In this case, whatever you throw in there, it'll copy it to the slash build folder, okay? Let's give it a shot, but first we have to write to me a six. So we're gonna do some basic ES6, okay? So in this case, we're gonna to go to our source directory and I'm gonna call it app.js. Matter of fact, I'm not gonna do this lowercase because we are mature and we have grown up and we capitalize files with the first letter that are class files. In this case, it's a class file. So we're gonna call this our class app constructor console. Log app 
instructor. Now you'll notice I just use dash colon colon. That's kind of my delimiter for method. So class name method, right? Or in your case, class name method. And init, init or initialize. App init. Now you are not allowed to call this inside of a constructor, but you can call it init. You can call it inside, outside the constructor. So as you can see, we have our basic class. Let's see what it does. We'll go gulp, babble it just a little bit. I want to see ya. <clears throat> Voila. Alrighty. So we've got our app file and our app file. So what's changed? Well, this is our ES6 app file and this is our ECMAScript 5 app file, right? So this will run all the way back to IE8 for the most part. <laughs> As long as you don't use getters and setters. All right, we're almost there. One more thing to do, and that is support many, 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 many files, many files. So if we write 20 billion JavaScript files, right, we need to be able to support that. So let's do two things. Let's wire it up so we can do more than just app, app.js. So we'll do, so instead of app.js, let's get a little crazy. Let's say anything in source we want to copy over, okay? So let's, uh, let's delete our build folder manually called go battle it and you'll notice now that it grabbed everything in there and copied over right in our app.js so we can create another one so let's create another file call it person yes class person and it has a say name which is console.log so this that first name. And actually we'll pass it in in the constructor. So we'll say first name. Say this dot first name equals first name. Uh, we'll delete our build folder again, run it again. And now we'll take a look and what do you know? We have two. We have our person and we have our app.js, cool. One other thing to add, actually two other things to add. First, we don't wanna to have to delete our build folder every single time, right? If we wanna put new code, we wanna change the folder structure of our JavaScript, we wanna we wanna make it nice and clean. So we're gonna add one final task for today, and that is clean. And what clean will do, now if you've done grunt, this should be extremely familiar. npm install gulp clean instead of grunt clean, right? Same dev. We'll bring in our clean function, which is actually gulp clean. Okay. So we're gonna have clean. It's basically just a JavaScript file with stuff in it. Again, return, being good citizens. <laughs> I'm a slacker at it. Source. We want to delete the build folder and we'll put the read flag as false. This is merely an optimization that they didn't default to false by default. It basically means don't read the file contents and stuff. It makes it a lot faster to delete. So we've got our files. Now what? Now we pipe them. Who do we pipe them to? Who do we throw the files that we want to delete to? We want to delete it. Hey, Clean, can you deal with these? Yes, I can destroy them for you, sir. Awesome. Thank you, Clean. I'm glad you're on the team. Add a semicolon. Call go clean. Watch the build folder get destroyed with all its contents with it. Fantastic. So let's call clean first, All right? So anytime we run gulp by default, we want to clean, have a nice fresh palette in which to code upon, and then it'll launch our server and it'll watch file. But what are we missing from our watch? We're missing our JavaScript. So let's add it. Gulp watch source star dot star JS. And anytime JavaScript changes, babble it. Okay, now Babel, it won't actually refresh the browser. And that's okay for now, but it should later. If your JavaScript changes in our Babel, it, we'd actually want to go, yo, you need to pipe it and let me know. We'll do it now. Why not? Say browser sync, reload, reload, reload. Stream is true. You are in a streaming environment. Welcome. Now, when we run gulp, all the magic works together in perfect harmony. So we can notice our build folder is clean. There's no JavaScript in it. We can change the way beta man. No way. We are awesome. 
Notice it refreshes, runs our task. We can play with some JavaScript, save it. It'll copy our JavaScript files to the build folder, right? So we can see them and see how they work. And if we started importing those and utilizing those in the browser using the ES6 stuff, we'd be good to go. There it is, ladies and gentlemen. You have your basic build server ready to go to do quick and fast automated ES6 Develop. Again, that's the Gold Basics. I hope that's helpful. Again, my name is Jesse Ward. You got any questions? Hit me up on Twitter, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on Google Plus, email. You know, I get tons of email, but I do read them. I might not respond to all of them, but I do read them. Don't forget to subscribe and like. I really appreciate it. Support has been awesome. I appreciate the feedback. I do my best to answer all your questions. Thank you so much for being supportive. Peace out.